I almost moved on to Romans 7, but then in looking over Romans 6 some more this past week, I decided, you know, I'm not going to leave it quite yet. There's, I said this, I think it was last Sunday I said this, but it, it's amazing the depth of Scripture, the depth of, of this letter in particular. You could spend forever just in one chapter. There's so many rich truths and all the ways that Paul conveyed those truths through repeated themes and terms and references to the Old Testament and so on and so forth. It's amazing. And in my mind, kind of attest to its divine inspiration because Scripture is so brilliantly written and points us to realities of who our Maker is and who we are and the good news of what He's done for us through Christ. And that's been our theme and, and will continue to be our theme as we study Romans. And in chapter 6, what we've been talking about the last few weeks really had different message titles and different sections of the chapter, but the, the recurring theme has been this idea that we've been identified with, with Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and that there is a newness and a freedom that's been given us in the truth. And as we live, we experience two types of things, if we were to oversimplify it a little bit, two types of things in our lives. One being a heart that's awakened to the value of God and desiring to live a life of faith and to appreciate Him. We want to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself and we endeavor to, to do that. We want to experience God's joy and peace and patience and all those good fruits of God's Spirit. And at times those, those fruits are manifest in our lives. And and the second reality is, is that at times we fail. And I don't even want to fall into the trap of trying to compare or quantify. Just, just acknowledging that at times we fail. We fail to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. We fail to love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't always experience God's joy and peace and patience. And we talk a lot at our church about honesty, and we believe that the gospel doesn't make us perfect. It doesn't just it doesn't cleanse the outside. To use Jesus' language of of the Pharisees, it doesn't just clean the outside. The gospel is truth that shines light to the inside, to the depths of who we are. And and so we want to be honest about the fact that in our flesh and our fallenness, that remains until we're on the other side. There will be blinders, deception. Call it what it is, sin, evil. It's true. And I was reminded of the importance of this more honest, I would say consistent perspective. Just the other day when a friend shared a story on Facebook, and I talked to the Sunday school class a little bit about it, but apparently a NASCAR driver who's known as being a, an avowed Christian, uh, I think he's the son of Joe Gibbs, the old professional football coach, Joe Gibbs, and I know they're known as being a Christian family. Well, this NASCAR driver apparently got in a fight with another driver after the race and, and ended up punching this guy in the, in the face once or twice or something. Uh, and so the friend that shared this, who himself, I think he's somewhat religious, but he just was kind of venting about how he hates all the hypocrisy of all these people who preach at others and all these evangelicals who claim that God is for them and he wants them to win the race or win the game or whatever, and they give credit to God and all this. But then when you look at their lives, this blatant hypocrisy, like cold cocking someone, punching them in the face after a race in a way that was unwarranted, unacceptable. And so that was interesting, made me think a bit and acknowledge that, yeah, absolutely, that sort of thing happens all the time, whether it's publicized or not, Christians fail all the time. And, and I fail all the time. And it's sad that the way people think of evangelicalism is that somehow we should be above that sort of thing or that somehow the point is that we are upstanding people when, as we've been seeing from cover to cover in Scripture and especially here in the book of Romans, that's not the point. Our track record is not the point. The point is who God is, His character, His heart, and the manifestations of, of the life and freedom and the fruits that we talked about earlier are 
are that. They're manifestations of God and our union with him that are miraculous, and we don't get to take credit for them or stand up as if we're holier than other people. That's not called for. It's not appropriate. It's not grounded in truth. The truth is we are all equally needy of God's grace, and that's the point of Scripture, and that's certainly the point of Paul's letter is that God, through Christ, has given us grace. And so we're trying to be honest and acknowledge that, yes, we, we've been made alive, but we also have this ongoing wrestling with sin and and Paul has been also addressing this issue of, well, if it's all of grace and if God has cleared us and forgiven us and if everything is established because of his grace toward us and it's unearned and it doesn't have to do with our track record, then it begs the question, and Paul, several places, explicitly anticipates the question of his opponents, well, then are you just saying then just sin that grace may abound? And we spent a few weeks addressing that, and I want to do a little bit more to address that question because it's an important one. And, and an accurate understanding of the gospel, the depth of the gospel in your humanness forces you to that place. You would have to grapple with that. If you're really seeing God as benevolent and kind and forgiving and has establishing you as right and everything about you is right in Jesus, regardless of how you behave, uh, yeah, it, it should definitely beg that question. Well, then can I just behave however I want? So Paul has been addressing that, and, and what we're going to see again this morning, as we look one more time at this passage in Romans 6 and jump around a little bit, but what we're going to see again is Paul does not respond to that question with law. He responds to that question with life. He doesn't respond to that question by heaping upon his listeners more obligation, more requirements, more demands. He doesn't respond to them that way because that is not grounded in truth. He responds to them in a way that's grounded in truth that has everything to do with the character of God and what he has revealed to us about himself and how that has, to use a big word, indelibly changed us. It's made an impact at a deep level that, that God has done through His Spirit to awaken us to His value. And we're going to see what that means. And we're going to look at a few things here. As I said, we're going to jump around a bit. We're not going to read the whole passage. Mainly, we're going to be in verses 12 through the end of chapter 6. But we will hop around, okay? And one of the things I want us to look at first is some of these metaphors that, that come up. In this section, Paul often uses, we could call it figurative language or pictorial language, like he's painting pictures with words to help us grasp things. It's part of being a good communicator. And he says in chapter 6, verse 19, I think this is why he says this, he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. I think what he's saying is, hey, I'm trying to use categories and concepts that you can relate to to convey to you these profound transcendent truths about God that require explanation and illustration. So that's what I'm doing. And so let's talk a little bit about some of those images or some of that figurative language. For one thing, earlier in chapter 6, he talked about being baptized, which literally has to do with just being immersed. Like if you baptize someone in water, you dunk it under the water. Dunk that person when you're baptizing him or her under the water and bring them back up. They're literally covered, immersed, surrounded by that water. And he says in chapter 6 that we've been baptized into Christ's death and also associated with his resurrection. He says that's what's true. God has put to death the old me, the old you, that part of us that only lived in separation from him, only lived independently. That part of us that deep down was driven by this deceptive thinking that said, I can find true life, spiritual life, satisfaction, security, significance in my own endeavors with my own sort of self-sufficient approach to things. He has severed in a very real way from his perspective, that part of us has been dealt with and put to death and is taken care of. Now, in our experience, what we acknowledged earlier is that thing still manifests itself, doesn't it? I mean, think about your own life just for a moment. When was the last time you, you were just irritated, flying off the handle impatient with your kids for those parents out there? He says here, and one of the perplexing things is in chapter 6, Paul says, sin will not have mastery over you. When you are just rip-roaring mad at your kids or your dog, for those who know the context of what's been going on with our dog this morning, or your neighbor or your coworker, I mean, do you, don't you feel sometimes like you're still being mastered by, you, you know you should be, forgiving. You know you should let it go. You know you should be merciful, but you're not. 
Or you, you turn again to whatever your vice of choice, whatever your therapeutic approach is, whether it be alcohol or food or glutting yourself on Netflix or whatever. You've done it again and, and you just feel disgusting and empty and ashamed and, and, and you just felt like it was overpowering. You, you just went for it and you, there, you find yourself there again. Or you, you, you couldn't help yourself and you checked the news and you spiraled into anxiety because once again you were told that the sky is falling and we're going to be dead by next week at this point. And so you're overwhelmed by anxiety and fear and there's no peace and, and you're extremely irritable with everyone around you because you literally feel like your life is threatened or what matters to you most is being threatened. I mean, in those moments, which you can relate to, right? Good Christian folks here on a Sunday. Although nobody's that good, because look at the front few rows. You guys are all sitting way back there. But in those moments, I mean, it definitely feels like it's mastering you, doesn't it? Is this Paul lying? I mean, if we're thinking carefully about this, you've you got to wrestle with those things. Is this book true? Well, he says, look, you, the reality is these things are true. You've been immersed in Christ, associated with his death, where all of that has been dealt with decisively by your heavenly father, and you've been identified with his life and newness. It's true. It's absolutely true. And there are moments when we experience that and the freedom of that, and there are moments when we don't. But it is nevertheless true from God's perspective. He says it's true. It's objectively true. And hopefully as we move along, we'll see a little bit more of how that all harmonizes and fits together and even makes sense of our life experience, including the ups and downs. Because, by the way, if, if you're reading ahead or if you've studied Romans before, that's not unique to us. The Apostle Paul experienced the same thing, didn't he? So Paul, who wrote these things here in 6, when you go to chapter 7, he says, hey, the things that I want to do, I find myself not doing. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. He experienced that struggle too. So it doesn't make us immune to that struggle. In one sense, it sensitizes us even more to it. Because part of that awakening to who God really is, is along with that, is we do care about how we act toward Him, toward others. We do care. So what truth does He have for us? Well, there's the metaphor of baptism. There's the metaphor. This is important too. He says in verse 12, there's this royal language. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. That's king subject language. The word reign, it's a verb, but it's from the same root as the word king. Don't let it be king over you. As we said, sometimes it feels like it is. Feels like it has mastery, doesn't it? And that brings up the other image he uses, which is that of master and slave. And he talks about here being slave to righteousness as opposed to slave to unrighteousness. And so there's, there's king subject language, there's master slave language, and all of it speaks to this issue of in our human experience, that fallen part of us is dominated by, stuck in, enslaved by what I like to call the tyranny of. Of autonomy. We talk a lot around here in Sunday school, in the sermons, about our root problem going all the way back to Genesis. Is not just that we break some rules. It's not just that we're mischievous sometimes and we break God's law. Underneath it, what makes that so insidious and evil and perilous is it is truly a rejection of our Creator. It is a it is a it's an attempt to dethrone him and to sit ourselves as king and what God tells us very clearly is when you are operating as an autonomous creature, you will suffer under the tyranny and slavery of that autonomy. And so he uses these images of king and subject and master and slave to speak to that. And we all know very well in the day-to-day, -day, the ups and downs of life, what that feels like. And he is saying, it is not your king. Sin is not your king. You are not a slave of unrighteousness. You're a slave of righteousness. Now, let's go 
a layer deeper than that. We can hear even that and our natural tendency for a number of reasons, our natural tendency is to immediately begin thinking of moral categories, what we call checklist Christianity or whatever, legal, legalism, legalistic thinking of just, okay, the do's and don'ts of things. And so when we hear we're not a slave of, un of uh, unrighteousness, but of righteousness, that sin does not reign over us, we just think in those checklist sorts of ways. But, but Paul actually, throughout Romans, takes us deeper. And one of the places we see that is in just considering, and this is interesting, but just considering what the word sin even means. So let's talk about that for a moment. What does the word sin even mean? What is sin? The, the term, and so you may have heard this from other verse-by-verse -verse teachers, they'll bring out that this term, which is used so frequently in the New Testament, has to do with a, a missing of the mark. And so you can think of like an archer trying to hit a target and missing the target. Uh, the root actually is due with the idea of like having a part in something and it's the opposite of that. It's like not having a part or share in something. So it's like missing or lacking. And, and it was, as I, as I studied this past week, I ended up in Romans 3 because I'm looking for places where does Paul say things about sin, use this term that make it even more clear what he's getting at. And I want to show you that he's getting at sin not as just a missing of the mark in terms of a missing the moral standard. That's where our minds naturally go. But I want you to see that he's actually talking about missing the person of God. Who he really is and what he's really like. That's what's at root. The term is used in places, has implications for behavior, attitudes and actions and things like that. But... What it, what it really is deep down at the bottom is has everything to do with this relationship with God and how we humanly violate that relationship. So let me show you one place that makes it really clear, and that's Romans 3. So go back to Romans 3. And a familiar verse here. Is verse 23. Paul's talking about law and righteousness and and then he says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You've heard that before, most of you. It's coupling together, joining together these ideas of sin and falling short of the glory of God. Now, the way that I used to interpret that idea of falling short of the glory of God fit with the way that I used to think in a way that I would say now is overly simplified or missing the layer of depth that it needs. And that is, I used to think that in a very... Um, standard type terms, missing, falling short, like God's really good at keeping his own rules and that's the essence of Jesus' glory and we're not good at it, so we fall short of that standard. Like us compared to a standard, us with reference to a ethical code, be, be it the Ten Commandments or any others that come from Scripture or humanly, Paul talks about earlier, even Gentiles who don't have the same heritage, they come up with their own law like humans. We're just drawn to law. And so we tend to think of this, even sin and falling short of the glory of God, as missing the, the mark, missing the standard. And and in life, we, we know in school and our professional endeavors, you got to hit the, hit the standard, man. There's a certain list of requirements, and if you check those boxes, you, you get to rise up to a higher level. That's just the way life works. But this is different. This book is pointing us to relationship, and it's not about missing a standard per se as it is about missing God. And so let me explain how that's the case. Sin, first of all, has to do with missing the mark. We said that. Uh, failing to have a part in, a share in something or someone, and coupling that, joining that with the idea of falling short, that term would be better rendered lacking, being deprived of, not having God's glory. Now go with me back to chapter 1. All this is contextual. These are Paul's definitions, not mine. Okay, Even though they're commonly pervasively spread around evangelicalism. Paul defined it himself. And look what he says about the essence of the human condition, which he later refers to with the term sin. Let's read in chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. 
For even though they, that's all humans, knew God, they did not honor him. And that word is the word glorify. So remember it said they lack the glory of God, right? Well, here, they knew God, but they did not glorify him as God or give thanks. Depending on your translation, it may use that word, or in the margin it may say glorify, but that's the word, same root in the original language. They did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and here it is again, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. So stop there. Do you see that this root human problem, this essence of unrighteousness, for example, has to do with this rejecting the glory of God? That word lacking, or translated so often, falling short of, it's the same word that Jesus used when he said to his disciples, hey, when you go out there and you're traveling along, don't bring a money bag, don't even bring sandals with you, but you'll be provided for. You will not lack any material thing you need. Paul talks about his travels. He says, I did not lack. I didn't go without. So it's that idea of going without. And so what do people go without by their own choice? The glory of God. The greatness of who God is. In our endeavors to be God, chasing our own glory, we not only forfeit any sense of true glory because we have none inherently, so it's forfeited in that sense, but we also, along with that, reject the true glory of our Creator. So that's the human condition. And then he says, and this fits perfect with chapter 6, therefore, verse 24, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so their bodies would be dishonored among them. So, un, so underneath it all, when we're given over, given over to these desires, these enslaving desires, the ones that master us, all the stuff we talked about earlier, what's underneath it? What is sin? It's missing. Missing who? Missing God. Every manifestation of anxiety, of anger, of greed, of lust, of all its various manifestations, sexual lust and every other kind of lust. There are endless numbers of them, just controlling desires. All of it comes from a rejection of, a distortion of, a minimization of the glory and value of our God. This is really important. We're going we're gonna to tie all this up in the end, but it relates to the idea of well, how... I mean, so what is, what is this freedom from sin then? What is this alive from the dead thing if I still struggle with it so much, if I still fail so much? It's going to help us understand that. If you can first see that the essence of sin is not just missing a standard. It's not about a, a governing principle in some non-relational way. It's about a governing person. So, so to put it in these terms, go back to chapter 6. Don't let sin be king in your mortal life so that you obey its lust. You tell me, who is king in your life? Who's king? Christ is king, right? Sin isn't your king. God's done something to reveal to you his glory and his greatness through Jesus, this amazing love, this otherness, this uniqueness, this mercy, this kindness beyond measure, and he's opened your eyes to it. And he's committed to continually opening your eyes. So when he says, a little bit later, in verse 15, I'll actually go back to verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Think of all of I've said. Naturally, we're drawn to law as a governing principle. And to be clear, God gave his commandments. He gave law. It has its good. It has a good purpose. But our natural, independent, autonomous way is to gravitate toward law. And he says we're under grace now. We're not under our law. 
or even God's law and how we approach it, which is in an independent way. That's what the Jews' whole problem is that Paul will go on to describe later in Romans. Like that was their fatal flaws. They they went at it independently as if they were supposed to do it, as if righteousness was by the law. He's like, you've missed the whole point. It's here to point you to your need for a relationship to be under grace. You're under grace now. You're not under law, you're under grace. So think about this with me. When missing God, to use that definition of sin, when missing God, when under the tyranny of autonomy, slavery of autonomy, all we have left is law in its cold, sterile, in a very real sense, dehumanization of ourselves and others. Law by which we seek to, to justify ourselves to control our world, ironically, to fulfill our own cravings. It just becomes a mechanism by which we continue chasing our own selfish desires. That's what I had a little bit of an interchange with, with my friend who posted that on Facebook about the NASCAR, the Christian NASCAR driver who sucker punched a guy. Uh, we had this interaction. I just said, I just said, you know, I it's sad to me that so often invoking God is just a way to cloak our selfish desires. We want what we want, and we try to co-opt God into giving us what we want, and we're even willing to do things that are harmful to other people in the name of God sometimes because we believe that God is on board with our agenda. And this is saying you're drawn to law. That's your natural state. And, and when law is, is reigning and dominant, you are missing God. And when you're missing God, Paul goes on to say, um, when the law comes, what, what is Paul, what's the reaction? What's the immediate reaction? He says, law came, sin revived, and I died. He says, when I heard God's law saying, thou shalt not covet, what happened? Found himself coveting. You were not created to live independently by a mechanism of some set of standards. You were created by a loving God to be in a father-child relationship in which you have been abundantly provided for, in every way provided for, another term for grace. And Paul says, you're, you're under grace. You're addicted to law. You're drawn to law. You use law as a way to hide from God. In some ways, as a way to boost yourself up, prop up your self-righteous. Well, I'm following these rules. I did this better than the next guy, whatever. To, to As accusational, to bring, to cast others down. That's Romans 2. He talks about that. That's what we do with law. Whether it's the capital L law, Ten Commandments. That's the way we pervert, distort the Ten Commandments. Or lowercase l law, where Paul says, hey, everybody comes up with their own standards, their own law. The most atheistic people who live in our world today who would say they're not religious are religious because they live by a set of governing beliefs and principles and they use their law, whatever it is, to judge and condemn other people who don't follow their law, whatever it is, as good as they see themselves following it. Isn't that right? That is welcome to earth, everybody. That's earth. And the message of the gospel is God invaded that place and the carnage that ensues as a result of that And gave grace and offers us himself and offers us a relationship and offers us not a governing principle per se, although there are principles, but all of it stemming from a governing person, a king, a master who is different, who is not a tyrant, who is not one who enslaves in the way you and I enslave ourselves and other people, who is benevolent and kind and gracious and eager to liberate and set free and says, go and live and I go and be who I created you to be and use the gifts and abilities I gave you. So that's why he's pleading with them when he says, shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? And may it never be. Why would you do that when your loving Father has set you free? And he thanks God. He says, having been freed from sin, you're slaves of righteousness. Which doesn't mean, listen, it doesn't mean you're always going to do better than you used to do. And it's a good thing. I mean, think about this for a minute. Just try to be, I don't know, maybe you would say there's been some change in my life, there's been some change, but there's certain things in my life that are manifestations of, of my sin, my unrighteousness, whatever you want to call it, that just aren't, I mean, I'm aware of them. They don't seem to be getting a lot better. 
Even when I think they're getting better, it's like something happens and here I am back to the same place again. Do you, can you guys identify with me in that? If you had to measure, first of all, you can't even trust your own assessment because you're finite and limited and you give yourself way too much credit by nature. But if you had to measure qualitatively like where you are now versus where you were five years ago, I mean, could you really say confidently I'm better than I was in X, Y, Z areas? Maybe there's some areas you can identify some change. There's some areas you may say I took two steps forward and three back. I mean, that's, that's more of like what life feels like, isn't it? So what if this doesn't have to do with necessarily a track record or life before a set of standards, but has to do with a reality that you've been awakened to, the mark, the point of who God is? What a shame would it be? For, it would be a shame for, for me to miss the point of a passage, for you to miss the point of a message. It's kind of a big deal, right? Sitting in any kind of instructions, like you want to get the point. What's the point? God is the point. He even uses language that stresses that. Missing the mark, the point. Don't miss the mark. Sin is not missing. Sin is missing the mark. The opposite is God showing you the mark, showing you himself, showing you his glory. That's your hope. And that's why a gospel-centered approach is the only approach because we need to see God over and over and over again because the only thing that can liberate us, the only thing that will decisively one day on the other side liberate us is when we are like God because, John says, we see him as he is. So he gives us glimpses over and over and over of his glorious grace. And that's, that's the remedy. And that's, he's committed to that. And once you've seen that, because of an invincible work of his kindness in your life and through his spirit, once you've seen it, I like this expression, you can't unsee it. Once you begin to see this law issue and say, wow, yeah, that's the way I operate. That's what makes the world go around. That's what contributes to the carnage in an ironic twist. We talked about David's life this morning. And we said, hey, there's David perceiving all these enemies who are against him. And I would, I would bet you money, if I were a betting man, I would bet you money that if you were to talk to an interview, the people who hated David, they could give you a list of reasons they hated David to include his law-breaking, whether it's their law, some other law. He was, to them, worthy of condemnation and worthy of whatever judgment or punishment they could inflict upon him because in their little legal system they were justifying their hatred of David and he was doing by the way the same thing that is earth that is the fray of life that is it and once you begin to see that you kind of can't unsee that and once you begin to see along with that we need a God who is different who is other who gives us grace and kindness who offers us himself and every provision who, who gives us life and that such that is an organic outworking of relationship that love and joy and peace come, not from looking at some set of standards and mustering up the strength within myself to try to do it. Not at all. It's an organic byproduct of a union with a person, with a king, with a master who's different, who set you free from you and from this world's fallen system and from your mortal slash literally dying body. That's why it says, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed for the outcome of those things is death. He says, yeah, think about it. Think about what it's like when you're turned over, when you're in that fallen mindset and your flesh is sort of reigning in that moment and you're just, what's the benefit? What's the fruit of that? It's literally the word fruit. What's the fruit of that? Well, you know the fruit of it. There isn't any. I mean, it's the opposite of fruit. It's, it's, it's the death of shame, pain, Violence, hostility, name it. No rest. So he says, consider it. And now, verse 22, having been freed from sin and slave to God, you derive your benefit or your fruit, resulting in sanctification. Sanctification, how so? In that it is so different. It is different than the law mode way of life. It is so radically different. That's sanctification, otherness, holiness. It's different. And the outcome, eternal life. In eternal life, John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. I mentioned this last week, but I'll just say it again. He says this, he, this is where Jesus defines eternal life. This is eternal life. And he doesn't go on to say that you'll live a really, 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 really long time. He says that you may know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. And he even says that you, they may know you, the only true God, 
the only true God and Jesus Christ whom God has sent. He says that's what you have for the wages of sin is death. Adam and Eve missed God, lacked God's glory, rejected God's glory, abandoned God's glory, and what did they experience? Death. What is the payoff of missing God's glory? Death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything we forfeited in sin, namely God, God has given back to us, namely giving himself back to us. And that is life. And so, there's an opportunity. Glad my computer went to sleep here. Anybody know my password? <laughs> there it is. I've only typed it a million times. We are free under God's grace. Which is not necessarily saying that you will always do better in life. You might, you might not. But there will be fruit. You won't necessarily be more polished on the outside. I just even picture Paul. I picture Peter. I, had, I used to have these very polished view, views of these guys. Um, I don't know. I think they were all kind of like sanctified halo versions of like Mr. Rogers or something. Mild-mannered, nice guys. All sort of the same. I don't see it that way anymore. They were gruff, rough around the edges, all different. They're fighters. They were tenacious. They were they got fights with each other. They they were real dudes. And they had a great message of a Christ who loved them as they were. And he said, I'm gonna. I'm going to change you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to do it by showing you who I am. I'm going to use your life and use the ups and downs. I'm going to use your successes. I'm going to use your failures to show you who I am. And, and Peter, even when you deny me, here's the good news. Even when you can't pray and your mind is so far from me, Peter, I'm praying for you and I have you. And not if you're restored, he says to Peter, but when you're restored. Remember the story, Peter denied him. So again, to prove the track record's not the point, okay? The apostle Peter Denied him, and not just one time. It's like later in life, Paul's having to confront him for denying him. Go back to the original, though, the original context of that where Jesus is talking to him. He says, look, I prayed for you when, not if, but when you're restored, strengthen your brethren. In what message, Peter? How good Peter was doing? No. This is who Christ is. Look at his faithfulness to me. When I was sinking, whether literally sinking or metaphorically sinking, he never let me drown. He never let me die. He always showed himself faithful. He always revealed himself and his kindness to me. And that's the promise of, that we have. That's the hope that we have. So that even, if, even as we are baptized into literal physical death at some point, unless he comes back first, which we're all voting for at this point, for that to happen sooner than later, at least I am, if, uh, if slash, you know, when death happens, slipping down into that abyss of death, of the human body just breaking down, there is still that hand reaching down to pull you out to resurrection life. And there's nothing you're going to do to stop him from doing that for you. No one takes us from his hand, he says. My, uh, my younger brother is fond of tattoos. I'm fond of not having them. Uh, I say no tattoo is the new tattoo because everybody has tattoos now. Um, and if you have one, it's great. I don't care. It's great. I just, whatever. It's not my thing, okay? So, uh, but I, I, he has one tattoo I think is great where it's, uh, it's like a graveyard scene and he has actually stones of some of his friends and family members who have passed away. And, uh, and there's this, his gravestone is there. And uh, you see his weak, bony arm sort of like coming up, out, and grabbing hold of it is the strong arm of Christ pulling him out of the grave. And from on the stone, it has the dates of his birth year, hyphen, infinity. And freedom is... Uh, 
on some level to varying degrees, knowing that to be true because of knowing who God is and what his heart is like and his commitment to his people and his great love for us. Because you belong to him. Because you're his subject and he's your king. Because you're his slave and he's your master. Because you're his son or his daughter and he's your father. And that's pretty good. Let's pray. God, thank you for the, the human language you use to help us grasp things that are beyond us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us and uh, showing us what you're like. We have countless ways of mischaracterizing you and distrusting you and trying to manipulate you even to get our way. Help us to accept these realities of death and life. Help us to reckon, reckon these things to be true, that we are under grace, not under law. That we live by virtue of union with you as recipients of your love. You've reached down to raise us up to new life. That even as we celebrate Easter next week, Christ was the firstborn of many brethren, many who would come, arise from the grave. And we get to be among those who have that kind of hope. As we live in this fallen world with evidences all around us of mortality and fragility, uh, conflict of all kinds. We thank you, God, that you're committed to persuading us of your goodness. And not that we, oh, <laughs> not that we get a free pass out of this fallen world. It's not yet, but that you hold us and keep us in it. And in the end, all the ones that you've drawn to you, that you've shown yourself, you've shown your glory, you've shown the glory of a crucified Savior who dies for his enemies. The glory of that kind of love and forgiveness. You've shown us Christ. And those you've drawn to yourself, you will raise up on the last day. So we thank you that we have that kind of hope. Be with us today. Help us to walk in, in freedom, God. Help us to experience life with some lightness. Some, some levity, some humor, some enjoyment of our families and our friends. Take one day at a time to live in the grace that you say is covering us. So help us to do that. Thank you for your commitment to being a good father who over and over and over again points us to yourself. Uh, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for everyone you've brought here. Pray you be with them as they go. In Jesus' name, amen.